Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Drew Thorstensen. Today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, contributing platform drivers to upstream OpenStack. Um, before we get started, I'm Drew Thorstensen. Uh, I work for IBM on Power Systems. I'm Adam Reznicek. I also work for IBM on Power Systems. Kyle Henderson. Ditto. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> so what we were uh, looking to do when we started our uh, upstream driver work, we have, uh, since we work for Power Systems, we actually have three hypervisor or workload containers or workload types that you can run on uh, Power Systems. The first is containers. So this is supported by the uh, Docker driver. It runs a variety of flavors of Linux, such as Ubuntu, RHEL, SUSE. We also have KVM. This is uh, just like KVM on uh, x86 chips. Uh, this is supported by the upstream libvirt driver. Um, that runs uh, same type of Linux flavors. Ubuntu, RHEL, SLES, you can run that directly on uh, the platform. And we also have uh, another hypervisor called PowerVM. Uh, this is supported by our new PowerVM driver. We actually brought it uh, forward in the Liberty time frame. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually a bit of a different type of hypervisor. It runs in system firmware, uh, so that's different than KVM. Uh, and what it allows is that you can uh, run Unix workloads like AIX, uh, also a, an operating system called IBMI or, again, any of the uh, Linux distros that you want. So what we were looking to do was to bring the PowerVM driver uh, upstream, move, uh, create an OpenStack driver that would allow us to support PowerVM uh, virtualization in an OpenStack environment. So the first question that when you start with OpenStack is, you know, you have to understand why are you going to contribute upstream? So I like to think of OpenStack as uh, much like an operating system. Um, it is the cloud's operating system. And in an operating system, you have device drivers. So when you want to introduce a new adapter or a new card, uh, you need to create a device driver to allow that operating system to interact with that device. So OpenStack provides compute, networking, and storage. And you have APIs um, that someone can go ahead and develop against those APIs to bring that device into OpenStack. And what's nice about this is uh, you have all of these different solutions. So for networking, you've got a wide variety of options that you can move forward with, lots of vendors there, and also just open source solutions as well. For compute, you have KVM, Zen, Hyper-V, VMware, LXC for containers, and PowerVM, which is what we brought forward. And storage, you have, uh, again, a wide variety of vendors and solutions that you can pick with this. And by implementing these APIs, you're able to interact with a wide variety of different storage and networking types for us, because we're compute. Uh, if you were networking and you wanted to bring a network device driver, you could bring forward uh, your networking platform and be able to interoperate with all of these different workload types. So it's very attractive to be able to bring you know, your platform to, uh, to OpenStack, because it opens up a wide variety of, uh, of workloads that can run on your platform. So now that you know, you've kind of decided, hey, you know, maybe this is a good idea. We should bring our platform upstream and have drivers and support it there, or at least you're saying that. So Drew would go on to the next slide. Uh, the big priority becomes, now what? How do we actually get from the point where you, know, you have your initial idea, you want to take this and bring it upstream, to actually getting a project created and functioning and out, available out in upstream OpenStack that somebody could actually download and use in their data center, which is the real priority. And so for a lot of people, they go out to OpenStack, they go to the website, they might go and find some manuals documentation, and it's a lot. There's a lot there. It's kind of confusing. There can be a lot of different bits and pieces if you've never worked with OpenStack before. Finding where you need to go to get started contributing code upstream isn't always a super easy process. So our goal here with this presentation is really to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what it takes to get from that first point in the maze from where you have that initial idea and bring it all the way through project creation, setup, working upstream, getting your code contributed, all these different bits and pieces so you can have that upstream driver. 
after I got handed over to his wedge. Okay. So in the presentation here, we've, you'll see we've kind of, as we go through, broken this up into five different stages of the project. You have kind of have your planning and proposing phase. This is where you'll go and basically after you've come up with the initial project idea, you'll go do research, decide out things like, you know, what do you want your project to be called, you know, where is it going to fit in upstream, all of these kind of things. You'll go upstream, you'll work with the upstream infrastructure teams to go create the project and all of that. You finally get on the ground. This is the point where, you know, most people would think that the process starts is that you can finally start writing the code, doing development out in the open, but it turns out there's a little bit before that. And then finally, they go through and get your upstream testing in place. And this is a really important piece that I think as driver contributors, we didn't fully appreciate at first the amount of effort it was going to take to get all of those upstream tools working with all of the processes to test our drivers. And then finally, the long-term support and integration of this. So you know, once you have it out there, how do you make sure you're following the OpenStack release cycle, making sure things are available, all of the different bits and pieces you have to do to make sure somebody can actually use your driver and it's not just a cool trinket that shows up on your GitHub profile. All right, so now that you've decided that you know, making an OpenStack driver is is in your best interest. The first step, as Adam said, is your planning and your proposing phase. And as you start planning uh, your OpenStack driver, you have to remember that you're entering a very, very large community. It is very fast moving. So before you, you jump in and you start writing the code, uh, a couple things to keep in mind is that you need to first research the existing code. Take time to, to bring in all of this information, dissect it, make sure you understand it. This requires a lot of listening. So you go and you maybe read the forums, you read the wiki, you go in IRC, and you need to understand why things are the way they are. It's very nice that we have Git, which allows us to go back and see the commit history and the reasoning why things are the way they are. Um, but it's also just spending a lot of time to understand. Um, I know a lot of things when we were looking at the code the first time were a lot of why is it done this way. But being able to dissect that history really allowed us to understand how things have evolved. And OpenStack's very fast moving, so you have you know, thousands of commits on these things. So it's very important that you, you take the time to understand why. You also need to figure out what exactly you're going to support. Um, so if you have uh, a Nova driver like we did, there is a requirements matrix of what a Nova driver needs to support. Each project is going to be a little bit different about this. There are some required aspects, there are some optional, um, and then there's new development that maybe there's new function that you want to bring forward. So you need to understand what are you going to bring in. I'd recommend that you don't try to do it all at once. You, know, you can add function as you go. Um, you also need to spend some time to figure out how you're going to do your continuous integration. This is one of those requirements from the community, uh, and we'll dive into it a bit more. But you need to be able to test your code in an automated fashion. And those tests need to be published with every single run. So you need to understand this at this point, what are your CI requirements going to be, your continuous integration, and make sure that you start to gather the, the hardware or you have a place that these, these continuous integration tests can run. Uh, communications key. Before you dive in and you start proposing things, make sure that you, you talk to the appropriate individuals. Depending on the project you go in, there are, uh, well, every project has a PTL, but there's also typically cores associated with each project. So you can go in and you can listen in the IRC, you can talk to them. Uh, either at IRC, mid-cycles, or here at the summit. There's a lot of sessions where the PTLs are speaking about their, their respective areas. And perhaps the most important thing that, that we've seen a lot of people get uh, hiccuped on is that you need to remain committed to this. This is not something that you write once, and then it's going to work in OpenStack forever. You don't need to write any more code. This is something that's going to live for years, and you as the driver owner need to invest in this for years to come. And it's important that you know at this point in, in the phase that you're committed for years. Because if you're only going to do it for six months, it's actually going to be a, a big debt. So you need to make sure that you're invested and that, that when you bring something forward, you're going to support it for the life 
uh, that you expect it to be. And it's, it's always important to remember, right, just because you know, you're, you're, you're a, a small fish in this big community, and just because it's the most important thing in the world to you, you have to see it from the other people's eyes. This is a community supporting many different uh, hypervisors, many different storage drivers, network drivers, and then all of those layers on top. You're, you're a small fish in the big community, so try to keep that in mind as you're talking to others to be able to express why do you need to, why do you want to bring this forward, how are you going to do it, and, and keep that in mind. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to have the same priority as you. It's not going to be as important to them. So that's, again, why you have to be committed for, for a long time. All right, so you're at the point now. You have officially decided all of those things that Drew outlined on the last slide. You're good to go. You know exactly what you want to bring upstream. So now you're at the point where you can actually go out and create your project. And really, how hard could it be, right? You just want to get repo to put your code in at the end of the day. I mean, you choose your project name. There might be a few other steps in there. Bam, your project's created, and you're ready to go and start getting this out to your customers. Uh, it turns out that step two might need a little bit more definition there. So uh, actually, you, that first thing you would want to do is turn upstream for your resources. And this is something that you know, I'll kind of reiterate, reiterate is important here, but also throughout the entire process is being involved upstream, talking to people, using documents. And you know, if you run into problems with those documents, contributing back to future people creating projects can also benefit and not have to go through all of the pain you had to deal with as part of that process. And there is actually a full, complete project guide that the Infra team has actually put together upstream, made on odocs.openstack.org that I've linked here, that will actually go through step by step for the most part, you know, what you need to do to get a project created. And so it's a pretty useful guide. And so, you know, there are, when, as you're working your way through that guide, there are a couple of key variables, key components that you need to think about as you're doing that, you know, especially like Drew talked about, you, where you have to know, you know, exactly what you're contributing upstream. Is this driver going to be part of an existing OpenStack project? Is this something that would be, you know, in Neutron, for example, as a sub-project because it's a networking driver? Is this a Cinder storage volume driver that you're going to have, or is this just a related project, maybe it's just a set of scripting or something for you to be able to do deployment of your tooling, you know, using so, something like Ansible, for example. You really need to think about, you know, where exactly does this fit in the OpenStack ecosystem? I mean, there's been a lot of work that's happened to make the ecosystem very inclusive, but you, it's a good idea to know up front exactly how you expect this to fit in. Well, and, and one thing to add to that is that each project is potentially different. Mm -hmm. Um, so like Neutron has sub-projects where you can take your driver and you can have a, a separate repository for your Neutron driver, whereas I believe Cinder right now has all of the drivers integrated into the main Cinder project. So you have to learn a bit of the culture of the project that you're going into as, as you learn. You might not necessarily need to jump straight into a project creation. Um, you might be able to contribute it directly upstream mm -hmm. into, say, a Cinder, um, that's why it's also important to do that listening up front. Um, Nova, for instance, with us, we have a separate project. And as our usage is growing, we work towards integrating that upstream. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that we've learned through working with the, the Nova cores is how that culture fits in that project. And they're not, it's very important to know, they're not all the same. They're all different cultured projects, and, and you have to understand that. And they don't always all necessarily get along or do it the same way either. I mean, we have, so we have our Nova driver. We also have our networking Power VM driver, which is a sub-project underneath Neutron, where we have all of our code required to put our driver. And then we have another driver for Solometer, and that's a different type of project altogether. And so you're going to, you know, if you have a platform that might have multiple projects, you have to be able to work with multiple sets of requirements, PTLs, and cores to figure out exactly how all of your bits and pieces are going to fit into all of those projects. But once you figure that out, then you kind of you know, need to start thinking about what sort of upstream resources does my project really need? I mean, you obviously need a place to put your code. 
But beyond that, what are you doing for documentation? How are you doing translations? Do you need that support from the upstream community? All of these different pieces are things that you know you might not think about you know if you're just looking to find a place to put your project but they're really important to your end users because they're the ones who are going to have to be able to go and install this and use this in their environment at the end of the day uh oh <laughs> and finally i guess that last piece is up there is you know what where how is this project actually going to get tested and like drew mentioned there's requirements on ci and there are multiple ways to do it you can be integrated with the upstream gate you can have your own independent third-party CI that runs against all your jobs. You can have all kinds of pieces in between there, some out of both buckets, but figuring out that right balance that you know, is going to be required and for each project, if you have more than one, is pretty important. You know, there are some, like Nova, for example, is very explicit. You have to have third-party CI for your driver to be considered supported. It has to run on every patch, whereas other projects like Cinder or Neutron aren't quite as stringent. They would like you to have it, but you know it might not be required at the end of the day. So just basically making sure you know you have just a couple tips here, but making sure you set yourself up to participate in the community. You know you're not just because you're your own. If you're on your own separate project, you're not on your own. You have to be integrating with the teams upstream, attending their IRC meetings, making sure you know some change they're going to make in Neutron to the ML2 stuff doesn't break your ML2 driver downstream so it doesn't work. All these bits and pieces. And then just be, frankly, be patient. I mean, like Drew was saying, you're a small fish in a big sea here and making sure that, you know, when you want to go and do a release, for example, working with the release team to make sure that they can go through and they have time to do that and everything among all the other projects they're also doing releases for is a pretty important part. Get you here. So leading all up to that is when you actually start your development. So things to kind of look at as you start is look at a, a lot of existing projects that are out there. Do, go ahead and do Git clones. Um, start looking at some of the tools that they use. There's a lot of great tools out there, and I named a few of them here, Tox and Flake 8, Hacking, Bash 8, a lot of different tools out there. And by looking at the projects, you can not only see the tools that they use, but how they're using them. Usually the documentation is you know, pretty good on a lot of those tools, but the examples that the projects provide are even uh, better. It, it was kind of turned out as we were developing our projects, you know, we could look at the documentation, but finding out how those tools were used specifically within like Nova or Neutron was uh, even more beneficial than the, the smaller examples that were in the documentation. And that's especially important because the documentation might not always be completely up to date, but by looking at these projects, you can see what's in use at that time in that release. The other thing you'll notice is that there's a lot of common libraries in Oslo that are used across the different projects. So spend some time going out to Oslo, look at all the different um, sub-projects that are out there and understand what they're doing, what problems they're solving. Because um, by adopting those types of uh, libraries, it, it really helps development and helps the adoption of your um, project just because they use common solutions. And kind of what we say is, you know, be a chameleon as much as you can. Obviously, your project is going to be a little different, otherwise you wouldn't be developing it. But as you look at the other projects, you can really see patterns, patterns on the way they do directory structures, um, patterns on tools that they use, patterns on common libraries and that type of thing. Um, but if you can't follow a pattern for some reason, obviously you're going to have things that are unique. You know, understand those uniquenesses and be able to explain them. It's, it's usually a lot easier if you, uh, you know, can explain them to somebody why you have something that's a little bit different or can't use the common patterns or common tools or something. And maybe along that point is, uh, as you're developing, you have to have code reviews. And depending on the project, you might have different core reviewers. And the core reviewers are ultimately the ones that will merge forward your patch. And being a chameleon really makes it easy for those cores to have a consistent experience as they're reviewing the code. If you follow the same patterns, it's going to be easier for them to understand what's going on and allow that code through. If you go and you do it completely different, it's not going to get approved. And in, if you're developing in, say, Cinder, where every driver is in there, the cores really need to be able to understand exactly what you're doing. Um, Ultimately, they hold the keys to whether or not your code gets in uh, based off of whether or not um, they understand and agree to everything in there. Right. So those interactions and being able to explain things are really important. 
One of the tools that I kind of liked was this hacking rules tool. Um, it's a Python tool for you know, looking for unwanted code patterns in the actual code. And a recent example was that the, the log.warning was deprecated, or log.warn was deprecated, and everybody switched over to log.warning. Um, just a little bit difference there, but there wasn't originally a rule out there in hacking to find that. And we found that as we were getting rid of stuff, people were still, you know, weren't quite changing their habits and still typing in log.warn. So putting a hacking rule out there that says, you know, looking for log.warn and putting out a message that says, you should be using log.warning and actually flagging that and not allowing that to compile or, or pass validation was really good. So that was kind of neat. Um, and you can also adopt a lot of those types of rules from the different projects. Um, Nova had a ton of rules. So as we found hacking and started to implement in our project, we adopted a lot of the ones that were in Nova so that we were very consistent. So that our Nova driver had a, you know, a lot of the same rules that the Nova drivers did in the main project and just being a chameleon there, right? Um, and there is a good reference on how to uh, actually write a hacking rule. If you've got something unique to your project um, and you want to make sure some pattern doesn't get into your code, um, there was a little web page out there for how to actually write a hacking rule and, and have it be validated. Yeah, and I think Kyle made a really important point there again and on being a chameleon is that if your driver belongs to a specific project like Nova, for example, our driver was you know a, a compute driver that fit into the Nova project, you would want your driver to be as close to the rules and the culture of that project as possible. So, you know, if you're writing a Neutron driver for your ML2 agent, you would want to make sure that you borrowed hacking rules and style and all those pieces from Neutron and the same thing for Cinder or Ansible or any of the other projects that you would be building a driver for. I think with that hacking rule, we, uh, I think you made that log.warn hacking rule and then you know, that was seen as valuable and we had somebody actually come into our projects and then start porting that to the other projects as well, which was really nice that, you know, something that, you know, we put in was then replicated across these other projects, which is one of the benefits of being part of this open community is that, you know, it's not just following them. If we, we have something like this that was seen as, as useful, we can then bring that to the other projects or, or they'll come in and take it from us as well. Borrow it from us. <laughs> okay, so upstream testing and, and you know, centering on, on testing here, good unit test is invalu invaluable. We found that, you know, day in, day out. And when we started our projects, um, you know, we tried to write a lot of tests. And it, it seemed like as we started out, we looked at what was, what was out there. And it's pretty common knowledge now, but there's still a lot of testing tests out in Nova that uses MOX, MOX, but it's been... Um, pretty publicized that everybody should be using uh, mock rather than mock. And uh, so we did all of our unit tests using mock, um, but we also found that as we wrote unit tests, we did a lot of duplication, like, right? We, we mocked up a few resources, we did our tests, and then we found, oh, we need another test to test this other scenario. So we did a lot of cutting and pasting, and um, one developer would create two or three tests, and another developer would add some function to the driver, and then they would copy those tests down. And it turns out that we had a lot of duplication, and then we kind of stumbled upon fixtures. And fixtures are kind of the answer to getting rid of a lot of that duplication. So if you study you know, what you're mocking out for all these different test cases, study the resources that you need to mock out, you can set up these common fixtures that'll do all of that setup work for you up front. And you won't have all this code duplication, but it does take some you know, a little bit of stepping back from the tests themselves to look at the resources and how they can be commonly mocked out. Um, and there may be some cases where you set up a fixture of some common mocks, and everything's you know nine tenths done, and then you just have to tweak a little bit more for this extra use case. So as you're developing use cases, make sure that you kind of take the big picture view of it's not just this one unit test that I'm coding for. You know, I really should be looking at the resources uh, that I could create a fixture for, and down the line I'll use it you know, 10, 20, 30 more times. Um, the, the last point is good unit test has to run fast because it's, it gets run a lot. And we got to make sure you're not doing things like sleep. You know, um, there's some cases in the code where you might want to do context switching and stuff, so you might have a sleep zero. But there's other cases where you might have some some other type of something that waits uh, for a retry, or something like that. But we got to make sure that those types of sleeps 
and uh, it, are not being executed. They're actually being mocked out in the unit test net because they'll be uh, run many, many times in CI. And even not beyond CI, that's really important for even just doing local development or if you have other contributors to your project because if your tests aren't fast, if some guy has to sit there and he wants to write a one-off patch for your project and he's never going to contribute anything again and it turns out that your unit tests take two hours to finish running, he's probably not going to be very excited about making contributions to your project anymore. So. I think one of the things that I found was that we actually spend a lot more time writing the unit tests than we do the code, yeah. which is a very different mindset uh, than, than what we were perhaps used to. Uh, in the past, it's get the function out, deliver this, and here you need to make sure that it's robust, that you need to understand when something breaks. You know, almost all of OpenStax in Python, um, and it's a non-statically typed language, so a lot can go wrong. And these unit tests really provide the ability to know when something's broken. So we'll spend up to three times the amount of time on the unit tests as the actual code itself. It's very common. You need to invest in these because they make sure that you don't spend, you don't, you don't keep paying that cost over and over again. Because OpenStack is constantly evolving. This is a very fast moving community. So when APIs change, things like unit tests, and we'll talk about the CI in a minute, they really help you understand when something's changed and you need to react. Right. So we'll now talk about the third party CI. Uh, most projects require that if you're bringing a driver in, that you have uh, a continuous integration server. So this is run with a project called Tempest. Tempest is a, a, uh, an OpenStack project that runs about 1,000, I think now it's like 1,400, maybe more than that, uh, functional tests against an OpenStack cloud. Um, and the way that this third-party CI works is for every patch that is proposed to your project or to the project you're participating in, you need to run the entire Tempest suite. So you need to deploy an OpenStack cloud, configure it to use your driver, and then run over a thousand tests against it. This takes time. Um, the reason for this, though, is really twofold. Um, the, the first reason that happened uh, was that the authors of the patches would perhaps be aware when they broke something. Um, this is important, say, if you're developing against libvirt and you introduce a change for, for Nova and the libvirt driver. Maybe you find out you break something and you need to go fix it. Maybe something along the chain is broken. But for, uh, for other drivers, perhaps, it's also important so that you understand when a big change is happening in the community. And you can react, actually, before that change is merged into the community. So by running this with every patch that's proposed to the community, you can actually understand, hey, this big refactoring is coming in and I need to get a patch in my project ahead of time so that when that gets merged into, say, Nova or you know, the respective project, you, you react as well. And again, part of that's kind of dealing with uh, you know, whether you're a separate project or integrated into the project. Even if you're integrated, like in Cinder, where you're a Cinder driver, you still need to bring forward a third-party CI. The unit test tests a unit of function. This tests the global function across the, the cloud itself. But this is a really big problem. This is a massive investment. The amount of patches proposed per day are on the orders of hundreds. Um, and if you look at all of the projects across OpenStack, it's on the order of thousands. So the first thing, you have to understand which projects you need to run your CI for. Um, we, have the, we have a Nova driver, we have a Neutron driver, we don't have a Cinder driver, but we do have Solometer. Um, and so understand which projects you need to be listening for events for. Now, the average runtime is about two hours, depending on you know, the project and the driver. Um, we find it to be about two hours, at least for our driver. Um, and if you're doing this several hundreds of times per day, you're deploying several hundred OpenStack clouds per day and running a thousand tests against each of them. That's a lot of infrastructure. So, you know, you have to think about this a 
a lot. You have to do a lot of upfront planning. Um, can you share resources? Uh, KVM uses a technology called nested virtualization. So putting open stacks in open stack VMs. Um, there are other, other ways that you can share this, this infrastructure. So you need to spend some time, think through that. I know that we had a big challenge here because uh, we are uh, a flat hypervisor. We run in firmware, so there isn't that nesting capability. But we found ways to, to optimize that, that infrastructure. Now, this, albeit a big problem and a big undertaking, the good news is you're not the first one to do it. Uh, in fact, you're probably several hundredth person to do this. Um, and everyone's been here. Everyone's worked through this. Um, the good news is that the community CI infrastructure is all open source. So it's all out there for you to see and for you to use. There's oh, this really good OpenStack project called the Puppet OpenStack CI. Uh, what this provides is third-party vendors, a way to deploy a basic OpenStack CI infrastructure. It's set up initially for KVM, and uh, it's actually, I think, optimized for Cinder drivers at the moment. But it, it really is a great foundation. Um, you do need to spend time customizing it to get your componentry within it. Um, and to, to make sure that it's, it's testing your code and setting up you know, VMs for that. So it's really good that you have these resources here. Uh, it's also important that you set your success criteria. Um, we know that a lot of the CI infrastructures in the community are, uh, well, you know, there's the pet and cattle mentality. Many of the CI infrastructures are pets. They set it up once, they update it, they make sure that it never goes down. And since these CI infrastructures are voting on every patch set that happens, if that CI system does have a hiccup, you start putting a minus one or a disapprove on every code review. And it turns out the community is going to get really mad at you if your CI system's off in la-la land minus one everyone's patch. So for us, what was really important was we recognized that you know, stuff happens. At, at times. So one of our criteria was that we would be able to tear down and redeploy our entire CI infrastructure with a single script. And uh, we were doing this in case of you know, something went wrong. And it turns out that this has just been a really great feature for us to put into our CI script or our CI infrastructure. Because if you just need to update everything, we now have a single point of execution to update everything. Um, but it's very important to know that you have all of these resources here. You're not the first one doing it. And the community has really spent a lot of time to make sure that you will be successful here. Yeah, and I think I would say one important thing, uh, even beyond you know, the fact that the Puppet OpenStack CI project makes it easy to get started, is that it makes it easy to get help if you mess up. If you go off and design your own CI system on your own, it could be the coolest, most complicated thing, and you hit a problem you are suddenly now the only one with that problem. Nobody can help you figure out how to solve that. But if you're deploying the common tools from upstream, if you're using Zool and NodePool and Tempest and pulling down all these upstream projects straight from what they're using in the upstream infrastructure, when you have a problem, you're not going to most likely be the only one with that problem. You can drop into the OpenStack infra channel, or you can drop into the third-party CI channel, and you can ask questions, and people will be collaborating around the same problem. And you can actually contribute your fixes back upstream. And that's something that, you know, in the process of setting up our CI, we've done is actually found an issue in NodePool, for example. And we resolved it locally, and we pushed a stream a patch back up to NodePool itself so other people who are working on building their own CIs down the road won't hit that same problem. And by, by building on that open source foundation, when something goes wrong, everyone can reference that source code. Everyone can see why this might have an issue. Whereas if you build your own and you go ask for help, you have to understand that they can't even see. Your, your system. So if you've built a proprietary CI system and something goes wrong, yeah, you're alone. And this is why it's so important that these tools out there, uh, they, they make it, 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 it's still a very difficult problem, but it, it, it makes it easier. 
So one of the things to remember is you are building a new driver. When do you actually get started? Um, you can't just build it before you have a driver. So what we did is we, we took some time to get our driver actually developed, get baseline function in there, get the unit tests in place. And then once that was in place, we started to run Tempest against it. We found out that just running Tempest alone, we found several issues. After that, once we got Tempest running, we could then start working on building our CI. It's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. You do need to plan for your CI up front, but you also need to know when you have enough function ready that you can get started on your CI. Now, before your driver actually gets integrated, do expect the community to say that this needs to be running for several months before it gets integrated upstream. That's been one of the feedbacks we've gotten from Nova, specifically. Uh, another thing to remember is, so developing the driver's great, um, but there, you also have to be able to deploy this driver, get it into OpenStack uh, clouds. Just putting, say, a Cinder driver in Cinder doesn't necessarily mean that anyone can use it. Uh, it's, you've probably done hand setup and, and gotten it working. So there's two, two uh, points of view that you need to have when you're thinking about deployment. The first is with developers. Uh, you would have what's called a dev stack plugin so that you can be able to bring your driver into a development cloud. Dev stack sets up a development cloud. But also, and perhaps uh, more importantly, is with operators. How do operators take your driver and integrate it into their cloud? Um, and there are a lot of different tools that uh, operators will use. Operators that are using distributions of OpenStack, ultimately, you know, you might have to find out how that distribution is, is deploying it. Um, and, and you need to prioritize, obviously, for your, your, your users, what's the best approach. There are potentially three or so uh, OpenStack or open source uh, deployment tools that, that are prevalent in the community. There's Chef, there's Puppet, and there's Ansible. What's really uh, interesting about this, I find, is that DevStack, you know, that's for one to two nodes. These other operator tools like Chef, Puppet, and Ansible are really for being able to deploy to thousands of nodes. You have to understand how does an operator handle this from the thousand node point of view. So yeah, I mean, once, like Drew was saying, you have this perspective, and once you get up there and you have to support this long term, you need different bits and pieces out there in your environment. So for example, you mentioned the DevStack plugins, and there are lots of ways to work with DevStack. And when we first started doing our development, we didn't, you know, there wasn't really this concept of plugins upstream, and so we'd hacked this whole big wrapper around DevStack that was custom for our environment. and did a lot of our development out there that way. And it turns out that that wasn't a super awesome idea because every time something changed in DevStack upstream, our tools would tend to fall apart and break on us. And so once you have things like the plugins, for example, you can really start iterating more quickly on a lot of your development and make sure you're sticking closer to what they're using in the upstream community. And then finally, you just have the broader deployment piece that Drew talked about, really. I mean, you've got those Ansible, Chef, Puppet, and you will have to be involved in those communities to get your drivers supported out there. I mean, you can write code and get it used locally, but unless you're up there putting in specs and blueprints for working in that community to get your drivers in there, a lot of your users at the end of the day, the day will have no way to actually use your project, no matter how good it is. Yeah, the, the, the cores of the, the driver team will only care about getting the code integrated into that project but you probably have the point of view of, let's actually get this thing used. So you do have to work in these other projects mm -hmm. to have this holistic view of how do people actually use this code that I've produced. Yep. And I guess I'll, I think this is the last point. So I guess the one thing I just want to wrap it up with is really just be willing to communicate with people. That's a really important part of this is just be out there, be willing to communicate, talking to people, watch the mailing list, be in the IRC meetings, Go to conferences, mid-cycles, and summits and be there and talk about your driver with people because otherwise they might not know it exists. If they are going to put something in that's going to break your driver, you'll have no idea. But if you're there and you're present, you know, the cores and the contributors to this project will tell you up front, for example, a problem we had, hey, we're going to 
probably break live migration for your project with this kind of a patch that goes in. And you can get a little bit of a heads up. So just be present. Yeah. And consistently be present for a long period of time because this is something that you're going to own for a, a long time. And the community needs you to own it. And, and for your driver to be successful, you need to have that commitment. So, I think uh, we're at time, but if there are any questions. Uh, did you want to come to the microphone, please? So I got one question. <laughs> what do you think about the driver decomposition topic? Uh, driver recomposition? Decomposition topic. Decomposition. Yep. It's interesting because some projects have, so the question is what do we think about driver decomposition? And the background on that is in some projects you have all of the drivers integrated. In other projects those drivers can be taken out and the authors or owners of that code can have their own separate project. Um, and there are benefits to both approaches. Um, with uh, a decomposed project, you own solely your future, and you you do have to fit in within within the community model. But you do you are able to turn code in faster and make changes more quickly. Um, it's I, I don't know. They both have advantages. It's really up to the 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 the, the core team to really have some insight in that. It. It makes it easier for code, but you also lose a bit in yeah, doing so. Sometimes it feels like a bottleneck having code up, uh, upstream. I don't know if you had that feeling. Yes, it is a big, it, you know, again, you're, you're integrating into a big community. So if you're in a, in a fully converged project where all the drivers are in it, it can take several months to get patches through. Yeah, and it can be really painful to get yep. those reviews, but. You know, the flip side is, is if you are completely down, if you're not in there, if you're not upstream, it's a lot harder on your users at the end of the day. And so you basically are going from shifting, you're basically, if you go the other direction, shifting the burden onto your users rather than onto yourself. And that's usually not something that's good for the life of a driver, to be honest. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think we're at time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.